Hi, I'm Stu from Hive Mind Automation and welcome back to The Hive. In this video, we'll be taking a quick overview look at the Raspberry Pi Pico. We'll talk about what it is, how it's different from a Raspberry Pi Model B, and we'll take a look at a couple of basic scripting examples for the Raspberry Pi Pico and discuss a few ways that we might be able to use it while we're looking at those scripting examples, both in general and in the context of home automation. So while I roll the intro, take a moment to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified when I release new videos each week. And let's get started. So back in March of this year, I ordered myself five of these Raspberry Pi Picos, but they've been on back order until very recently and they arrived just a few weeks ago. I realized that I needed to uh, get a few more bits of hardware to make a slightly more practical video with some more practical demos. So I found another electronic supplier that specializes in Raspberry Pi Pico and other microcontrollers and accessories to support them. And I ordered a few more bits and pieces so we can go over a couple of practical examples today. As always, I'll be putting links in the video description below to where you can pick up the parts that I use in this video. Now we should probably start by talking a little bit about what a Raspberry Pi Pico actually is and just as importantly, what it isn't. The Raspberry Pi Pico is a very small microcontroller development board based around the Raspberry Pi Foundation's new RP2040 microcontroller chip. This chip here is a dual core ARM Cortex-M0 chip clocked at 133 MHz. Now that doesn't sound like much in the age of 16 core CPUs clocking at close to 5 GHz, but for a microcontroller that is actually pretty speedy. Which does lead us to make an important distinction. The Raspberry Pi Pico is a microcontroller, whereas a Raspberry Pi is considered a microcomputer. You can't run an operating system on a Pi Pico, and in fact it has more in common with an Arduino microcontroller board than with a Raspberry Pi Model B. The ESP8266 built into these Node MCU boards and also the Wemos D1 Mini are also considered microcontrollers. So hopefully that clarifies the distinction there. One of the key differences between the Node MCU and the Pi Pico is a lack of onboard networking like what the ESP8266 has. Like the Raspberry Pi, however, the Pi Pico does have quite a few input output pins or GPIO pins in order to interface with sensors so that we can use it to gather data or make changes to the outside world and control different things. Now similar to this Adafruit It's a Bitsy board and this Arduino Pro Micro that I've got here, the Raspberry Pi Pico has a built-in USB driver. And this means that with the right code, we can actually use the Raspberry Pi Pico, or these Arduinos for that matter, to emulate a keyboard or mouse, and we'd only need to plug in the micro USB port in order to do that. I've actually currently got this Arduino to set up to do just that, to help image computers at work. I'm actually planning to build a custom macro keyboard using the HID function in future. Um, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on more future Raspberry Pi Pico videos. Now, if we take a look around the board here in the center, as I mentioned before, we've got the RP2040 microcontroller chip. Just up to the right here is the two megabytes of storage. Uh, and two megabytes, again, doesn't sound like much, but in terms of a microcontroller, that is plenty. Just to the right there, we've got this boot cell button, uh, and that's just a tactile push button. And it's a bit hard to see on camera, but just over here, we also have an onboard LED, and we'll actually be uh, playing with that a little bit when we get into the coding. It's quite small. Um, but uh, you might be able to just see it there. 
And over here we've also got our micro USB port to plug it in and we can use that to both program the Raspberry Pi Pico and also power the Pico. Down either side of the Raspberry Pi we have all of our IO pins and that's how we can connect to the outside world to uh, either connect to different things that we want to switch on and off or even sensors. Now it is worth noting that the Pi Pico doesn't actually come with these pins soldered onto the board by default. It actually comes in a package like this with no header pins and you need to order those header pins separately. One of the reasons for this is these scalloped pin connectors here on the side. So what that actually means is that you can uh, plop this down directly onto a PCB uh, and solder directly to those scalloped pins if you were working on a final product, uh, helping to make everything a little bit thinner rather than having these pins on there. I ordered these uh, these set of pins separately uh, from a supplier here in Australia uh, and uh, they came with two 20 pin sets uh, and a three pin debug set. You can see uh, that three pin debug header on the end there uh, and I just soldered them on there. Obviously for the purposes of testing and experimentation using the Raspberry Pi Pico on a breadboard with some header pins is going to be a lot easier than trying to uh, solder the scalloped connectors directly to anything. So I'm going to pop this Pi Pico onto my breadboard here and we'll get started with some experiments just to show you some basics. Something that's quite handy, the place where I ordered the pin headers from uh, included this uh, handy little business card that includes the pinouts for the Raspberry Pi Pico. So we can actually uh, refer to this card as we work to make sure that we're connecting to the right place. So for example, I want to connect this black header to the ground which is one two three so this third one down so if i can get that into there perfect so uh i've just got that connected to this negative rail that runs uh this way uh, and that's going to the negative side of these two leds which we will take a look at a little bit later on uh, and while i'm at it i'm going to put this uh, blue lead into this port here and this red lead into this port here and that's GPIO 16 and GPIO 17. Now there are a few different ways to skin the getting started Raspberry Pi Pico Cat. For my personal preference I would recommend using MicroPython. Now as the name suggests MicroPython is a fork of the Python language specifically for use with microcontrollers. The Raspberry Pi Pico will run some C++ code similar to an Arduino but personally I'm just a bit more comfortable working in Python. To set up MicroPython on our Pi we need to download a file. So this is just the Raspberry Pi foundation page. I'm going to go to MicroPython Pi Pico. I'm just going to search that and I'm going to go to micropython.org uh, and I've found the firmware for the Raspberry Pi Pico and uh, I want to probably grab a stable version of the RP2 Pico UF2 file uh, so I can download that uh, this 1.17 UF2 file is great uh, so we can download that it's actually really quite tiny so I have my micro USB cable here I'm going to hold down this boot cell button here. So I'm holding down the boot cell button and I'm going to plug in my micro USB cable. And in a moment, uh, so we've now got the RPi RP2 mounted on our computer. It just looks like it's a normal USB drive. So what we can do now with the RP2 Pico file with the build date and the version number UF2 file, we can just drag that and drop that over onto the Pi that has mounted. It's going to take a moment and immediately uh, the Pi has disconnected and rebooted and that now means that we have an interactive terminal available 
on our Raspberry Pi Pico. Now if we wanted to we could use something like screen to just connect directly to the Pi Pico and start sending it commands over the serial bus but instead what we're going to do is we're going to use an IDE which will help us do some debugging and some other bits and pieces there as well. Now the recommended IDE for the Raspberry Pi Pico is Thony. Uh, this is Thony. It is a very cut down, very basic IDE for the Raspberry Pi Pico or for working with any Python, not just the Raspberry Pi Pico. And if we take a look at the web page here, we see it's a Python IDE for beginners and there's Windows, Mac and Linux versions. It makes it very easy to get started and it does come with Python 3.7 built in. Now, if you're not interested in Thony, I have seen uh, that there are potentially some plugins for Visual Studio Code. I haven't yet played with those, uh, but I uh, will definitely be taking a look at those at some point in the future. Uh, so now that we have the Thony IDE and we've got MicroPython installed onto our Raspberry Pi Pico, we are going to start with a really basic sketch uh, to flash the onboard LED on and off. Now the onboard LED, if we take a look at our reference card here, LED is on GP25 and you can, there's also a pin reference on the back of the board that you can refer to as well. A uh, little bit hard to see with the lighting here. So all we're going to be doing with the sketch that I'm about to put together is we're going to be turning on and off this uh, GP25 pin. So this is Blink Sketch I prepared earlier and straight off the bat we have, like any Python script, we have our imports at the very beginning and we're going to import from machine, we're importing the pin command and this lets us address the pins on the Raspberry Pi Pico itself. Uh, and we're also importing sleep from the time library here. Onboard LED, we're defining the onboard LED as pin number 25 and the type is an output pin. And then we've got this while true. If you're used to working with Arduinos, this is the same as our void loop. So we're going to initially set the onboard LED to the value of one. We're going to sleep for 0.5 of a second set the onboard LED value to zero and then sleep for another 0.5 of a second. So before we're able to actually upload this sketch to the Pi Pico, I'm going to need to go to Thony and then preferences here and click on the interpreter tab. The interpreter that we want to use is MicroPython for the Raspberry Pi Pico. We could use MicroPython for any of these others, uh, but we're obviously working on the Pi Pico, so I'm going to hit OK there. And the port, I'm going to select the board in FS mode, which is this uh, USB modem, and that is going to connect to the Pi Pico. So I'll click OK on that, and we see that we have an interactive terminal with the Pi Pico. So if I were to go from machine import pin, so exactly like the first line here, uh, and then if I were to define onboard LED equals pin 25 and pin dot out. So we've just set that variable and then I'm going to go onboard LED dot value and then I'm going to set a value of one. And you should be able to see there that our onboard LED has come on. Uh, and I'm just going to click the up arrow and then put that to zero. And it has now turned off. Now that's how we can manually work with the Raspberry Pi Pico using an interactive terminal, also known as a REPL. What I'm going to do though, is I'm going to run this script that we've written on the Pi Pico. So it's going to turn it on, wait half a second, turn it off and wait half a second. So I'll click run script and we should be able to see there that the LED is flashing on and off. So what we can also do here is define other pins. And we can save that and if I run that now we should then get all of the LEDs that I've got connected here blinking because I've got the red LED connected to the pin 17 and the blue LED connected to pin 16 on the Pi Pico there. 
and we can flash those on and off. Now being that this is Python, we can also do other variable substitution as well. So if I were to define a variable of sleep length and put that equals to 0 0.25 and inside these sleep statements, if I just refer back to the variable sleep length and sleep length. So now I can run that script and we should have the LEDs flashing quicker, which we do. So now what I can do is I can modify this as much as I want. I can change this to one and we have run that script and now it's a one second flash on each of those. So you get the idea, turning these LEDs on and off was pretty straightforward. Something else that's really quite good about the Raspberry Pi Pico is that any of the GPIO pins, so GP22 or GP21, any of those pins can be used for PWM. PWM stands for pulse width modulation and it's a common way to use digital output pins like these to emulate analog effects like dimming an LED or maybe changing the speed of a fan, those kinds of things. The basic idea here is to turn the power on for extremely short pulses and you can then moderate the voltage by changing the width of that pulse. The width of the pulse is referred to as a duty cycle with a 100% duty cycle meaning that the pulse voltage is high for 100% of the time. It's essentially just a value of 1 like what we were doing before. Whereas a duty cycle of 50% would be equivalent to a value of about 0.5. The voltage is going to be roughly half of what we would normally put through on that pin. So the voltage is high for only half of the pulse length and so on and so forth to the point that if you were just pushing straight voltage through, comparing it to the pulse width modulation and measuring that voltage, you would actually see the differences in the voltage for PWM. So I've prepared this example to demonstrate the PWM function on all of the pins and this will work on both the external LEDs that I've got here and the internal LED. So once again we are importing the pin and the PWM functions from the machine library and we're also importing the sleep function from the time library. We've defined our blue, red and onboard LEDs. So the onboard LED is always going to be pin 25. And we're also setting a PWM frequency. Now interestingly I haven't set a onboard PWM frequency. This may not actually be necessary. So inside our true loop we have these two for loops. Uh, so we've got one to go up and one to go down. So for duty in range 0 to 65025 we're going to set the PWM for each of the three LEDs to the function of dot duty as an unsigned 16-bit integer to the value of duty, which as we iterate through this for loop, uh, the value from 0 to 65025 will cast in there. So we're setting the 16-bit unsigned integer for duty as that number there. Uh, and then we're sleeping for a tiny fraction of a second. We can also then see the second for loop. We're actually going to do pretty much the same thing, but instead of starting at zero and then ending at 65025, we're starting at 65025 and ending at zero. And for each iteration of the loop, we're decrementing the number by one and setting the duty cycle value. So I'm going to save this script. I'm going to click run current script and what we should now see, they're dimming in and out. And so that is a pretty basic demonstration of how PWM can work and we can dim some LEDs with that. Okay, so flashing some LEDs on and on is fun and all, but it's not exactly super practical. So let's take a look at one last example using this DHT11 temperature and humidity sensor. I've pre-prepared a Python script to read the value from this DHT11 sensor and print the current temperature and humidity to the Python console 
every second. I'll be doing a little bit more of a deep dive uh, version of this in the future and we'll include some connectivity maybe with an ESP01 to link it back into Home Assistant. So we're not going to look too deeply at the script, we're just going to concentrate on the results of what happens when we read the data from this DHT11 sensor. So if I run this script now, Okay, great. So we've got our temperature 22.9 and our humidity of 37, 38. It's kind of climbing a little bit. And I'm just rubbing this sensor a wee bit to try and increase the temperature and the humidity is getting there. That humidity is climbing a fair bit. Temperature not so much, but it is climbing a wee bit. So you can see that we can gather this information uh, and gather this data uh, and do all sorts of things with it. If we had connectivity, we could be logging this into Home Assistant, uh, sending it over MQTT, for example. So as I mentioned, in future, I'll be working on a network connected version of this sensor to use with Home Assistant. And to do that, I'm going to need to add a network interface to the Pico, probably in the form of the ESP01 module that I mentioned before. So that's a very quick overview of the Raspberry Pi Pico, even though this is a longer video than normal. I do have a few upcoming project ideas for my Raspberry Pi Pico, so if you want to see those, be sure to get subscribed so you don't miss out. I'll be putting links in the video description down below to where you can get pies and other accessories that you might want to use for your own experiments. That's all we have time for in this video and I do hope that it helped you in your home automation journey. Be sure to comment down below with a home automation idea you'd like to see me cover in a future video and your ideas for home automation products utilizing the Pi Pico. Don't forget to follow Hive Mind Automation on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you like this video, hit the thumbs up button down below to give it a like. And if you're not already subscribed, please consider subscribing now. And while you're at it, hit the bell icon to get notified when I release new videos each week. Lastly, if you enjoy what I'm doing here and you want to help to support the channel, there is a buy me a coffee link in the video description down below. Hivemind Automation videos are not sponsored by anyone at this time, so contributions through the buy me a coffee link are put towards making more and better content for you to enjoy. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Stu from Hivemind Automation and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.